Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Baptist Church. Please stand with me for our first hymn this morning, hymn number 572. Hymn number 572, America the Beautiful. We're going to sing the first and the fourth. Oh, beautiful for spacious eyes, for amber. pray together and open up this morning's service. Lord, thank you for this day and time here that you've given us to come learn from you, Lord. Please help the rest of this day go well. Please help tomorrow and everybody's safety going on with everything that they do. In your name, amen. You may be seated. If you please stand with me for our last hymn of this uh, Sunday school service, hymn number 404, hymn number 404, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, Jesus' blood and righteousness. My hope is built. Happy Independence Day, my brethren. What a great day it is. I love this, uh, this time of year. I love what the 4th of July stands for. 
and uh, I'm just thankful that we still have our country and that I do believe it's still worth fighting for and even dying for if necessary. So praise the Lord and may God bless America. Amen. Well, I want to talk to you again this morning about 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. If you would turn in your Bibles there with me, please. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, just to get our, our baseline verse that we're using, we're studying through this series on this verse, which I've deemed to be called, you know, Paul's ministry summary here, that can be our ministry summary, can be our life's verse without us calling it as such. It's almost rather presumptuous to try to claim it for our own personal life's verse. It seems almost kind of uh, boastful to try to claim this verse because it is so, uh, I think, encompassing and empowering. I mean, it's just, it, to me, it's a tremendous verse. But it says in verse 12, for our rejoicing, our rejoicing. You know, Paul doesn't say my rejoicing. He says our rejoicing. That's why I say we can have this thing together. We can share this verse for ourselves. Our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you, word. We've gone through uh, the first half of the verse, really, and now we're dwelling on the aspect there of but by the grace of God. Last week, we kind of opened it up to the class, and we asked basically for these kind of inputs. First of all, what does grace mean to you? And, and perhaps to start with, a, a scripture on grace that is relevant, particularly uh, mindful or precious to you, and, and what that in turn, cause grace to mean to you. We've looked at these verses here, uh, f inputs from the class. We had different inputs. Brother Pat started us off with, with kind, and then we talked about pure, undeserved favor, love, and forgiveness. It's proper. It's fitting. Uh, gives us, it's a, it is, in itself is a su supernatural ability, certainly that we would not have on our, and we do not have on ourselves, and it is sufficient. And all of these, um, you know, grace is at the same time both, I think, simple and quite complex. There are just so many facets. It's like uh, a precious stone, say a diamond, that has been cut by a, a master cutter to show and take the shape with so many different facets on the diamond. You know, they have different cuts that they talk about, not would not even begin to name it, any of them at all. I don't know that kind of stuff. I'm, <laughs> I mean, I, I was born and reared in uh, Arkansas, which is the location of the only diamond mine in North America. And uh, I've never been there. I, I, I wish I had, but every once in a while you'll see a news item where somebody has found, particularly after they've had a good rain, they go in there and they turn this, it's a field basically as I understand it, and they go in there and they plow it up every once in a while and particularly after a heavy rain, the tourist will, will pay, you pay so much to go in and look for a diamond and, and the tourist will go out and every once in a while you'll hear of somebody finding a significant diamond, precious stone, right, there in Arkansas and then they can take this thing and they get to keep it, it's, it's theirs, they, you know, the place is still making money, believe me, um, but they, get, they can take that thing and they can take it to a jeweler or to a, a stone cutter and they can take and just make the custom cut that really fits that stone, but has different facets. So here you are looking at one precious stone, grace, one valuable jewel of God, grace. And yet that grace has been cut by the master to have so many different facets on it to look and to see, oh my. And I think, you know, while we talk about what grace means to us, Really, it's a, it's a snapshot of where we are today right here because at any given time in our lives, we can be in need of any one of these aspects that we've named already, and I suspect we'll get perhaps some more today. But our particular need at that particular moment can be met. It is sufficient. Grace is sufficient for whatever we may need at the moment. And, and as a matter of fact, I contend that we need something every moment <laughs> that's not of ourselves. We need something. You know, we, we want to actually serve a greater cause than ourselves. I think that's really why we're here this morning is because we see 
in life a greater cause than just ourselves. Otherwise, we'd still be sleeping in, you know, we'd still, or we'd just about be having our first cup of coffee in the morning. But no, every one of us in here has made an effort to get up, get ready, and get here on time or close to it uh, uh, to um, serve a cause, if you will, to hopefully learn about a cause that's greater than ourselves. And grace enables us to do that. Now, so with that in mind, now, last week I got uh, some feedback from uh, our dear friends Fred and, and Nancy Herner down south. If you're listening today, and I suspect you are, thanks very much for the suggestion. And I welcome that, uh, those kind of suggestions. That was a, more of a technical suggestion. But I also welcome suggestions in, in terms of, in fact, my, I have opened the class up on different occasions before, but I've, I've specifically chose this time. Well, really at the impetus of someone's suggestion to say, hey, you know, you're getting where we might could use some input from or benefit from input from the class. And yes, you're right. It is time to do that. And so that's kind of what we do. So anyway, I welcome input in anybody. Uh, you don't have to be in here present. Fred and Nancy uh, texted me to have a microphone for when we take out, take questions and comments from the class. And I look, went back and listened to the lesson. And indeed, I try to get close to you with the microphone that I'm wearing, but that's not always adequate. So uh, Brother Gray has provided us with a microphone, and Brother Jerry is ready to use it. So we'll want to be able to use that that way. Folks at home can hear you. In fact, everyone here can hear you while I make note of any verses or comments that you might have from up here. So here we go. Does anyone this morning, and I know someone does, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and call him Brother Brian because he spoke to me after class last week with I thought was a very poignant, uh, relevant uh, point. Don't let me down, Brother Brian. Uh, <laughs> that Brother Jerry, if you could take the microphone back there to Brother Brian, there in the back row. Brother Brian Powers has got, uh, I think, a very, made a very valid, John, valid. Yeah, okay, so, okay. Uh, Hugh, your message as of recent about testimony of your conscience. <laughs> Every one of us in this room should be not enjoying the testimony of our current conscience simply because of the condition that our nation is in, the devil is alive. Mm. And so as Hugh uh, brought the message last week to grace, I'm reminded of Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I watched a uh, documentary <laughs> this week of Justice Clarence Thomas. And I'll tell you what, with what he's gone through as of late, that man is a perfect example of grace. And um, as I just bring this to a conclusion, I get to work with folks on a nearly everyday basis. <laughs> And some of them don't have the understanding of the relationship with God that I do. And for me to apply the grace that I've learned through Pastor Payne and this church uh, is a direct reflection on the testimony of my own conscience. And um, lastly, God provided David with the stones mm. uh, because we all need to have our own quiver filled with stones because there's never been a more important time to use them. But David had to identify the testimony of his own conscience and then use those stones that God provided with some grace. Amen. So I key in on, and I, uh, I key in on what I heard you say, Brother Brian, and, and particularly from that verse, in the aspect of ministering grace. And, and I get from your comments, that's really what... You're talking about taking this grace and using it to minister to others. It is a ministry resource, if you will. Grace, our grace, the grace that God gives us is a resource that we have to use to minister to other people, whether they know Christ or not. Am I following what you mean, or do you want to need to clarify what I'm saying or what you said to direct my notation here? Um, um. <clears throat> Let me try and apply it to Justice Clarence Thomas. Okay. Um, certainly, uh, he was faced with monstrous choices of how to move 
in a decision that can that should have never been placed where it was placed before but to understand what God is doing in your own heart to be able to apply the grace to others that may not be in the same place you are uh, in your walk of faith. Okay, that very good. Sense? So I, that, that too, I think, is consistent with my thoughts about the ministering resource. I'm going to try saying it that way. Ministry. Resource. And, it, and I see it as a resource. R-C-E. And I put the adjective ministry on it because in, uh, in having this grace that has been ministered, in fact, in the, the verse that we're talking about, 2 Corinthians 1.12, where it says, you know, we've had our conversation in the world and uh, more abundantly to you, word, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, we are able to have a conversation, to have a ministry, if you will, both to the world and to the brethren, especially to the household of faith. And I think that unless we, I would submit that unless we, um, it, it's one thing to appropriate the grace for ourselves and our own benefit, and God intends for us to do that. That's what it's there for, to, to benefit, bless, enable us to meet our needs. But it's also intended to be a resource, a tool, if you will, or a uh, an ability, because we talked about having super, uh, it is a supernatural ability to turn and use that grace to minister to others as they have been used of God with their grace to minister to us. I wouldn't be here today. I can go back and, you know, over the years I've mentioned and here some of the different people that God has used by His grace working through them to minister that grace to me. My, my, I've mentioned my Aunt B. Uh, who was instrumental, and my mother's sister was instrumental in seeing, in fact, she took me to church where I got saved, and she did much to me. I mentioned other people that have been a blessing to me. Um, no doubt each and every one of you can say the same thing. There's no such thing as spontaneous salvation. We have to hear the gospel. We have to believe the gospel. We, have, we need this book. This book is God's instrument. This, is, this book is God's leverage. And the, I'd say the, the fulcrum of that lever is grace. And God uses this book on his grace to lever us into position to minister to us. And I, I'm so very thankful for that, but we understand that with that reception that we have, with that blessing that we have, we've also received a, if you will, a responsibility to minister that grace to others as it has been ministered to us. Like I said, none of us would be here if it was left up to us. We've all had somebody's fingerprints on our, and maybe in many cases, such as my own, multiple sets of fingerprints on our lives that God used to leverage us into where we could see our need for salvation or we could see our need for some, maybe some repentance of something or maybe some grace, some ability, some recognition or some... In, formulate some commitment to get on the path that would best glorify God and be a blessing to other people. So, thank you, Brother Brian. Now, I would say this, that in conjunction kind of with that, uh, let me get where I want to get you to go while we're working on this. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, because what Brian is, is talking about, having that ministry, ministering grace, relates in my mind, when you were telling me about this, and I got back to my seat and was thinking about it last week, Brother Brian, I was thinking, well, there's a direct correlation, application, if you will, to what Brother Pat was talking about. I remember, if, if I recall correctly, Brother Pat was talking about, first of all, his brother, that he's concerned about his brother's salvation, and that he was going to be ministering, continuing, of course he's been doing it, but he's going to continue to be reaching out and ministering to his brother, and he wanted to always be sure to be kind, am I saying that right, Bonnie, do you remember? Kind to his brother, not have any aspect of his demeanor or his uh, presentation of the truth to distract or detract from that truth being effective in his brother's heart and his brother's mind. 
and that grace and would enable him, Pat, Brother Pat, if I remember this right, would enable him to have and show that kind of kindness to his brother that his brother needed. And, and I would say this, that while his brother is so very strong on his heart and should be, um, his kindness and his desire for kindness is not limited to his interactions with his brother. I see of his testimony, I see him endeavoring to set aside himself and manifest the kindness of God's grace to other people. I, I see it all the time in, in that brother. So, you know, I appreciate him contributing that. But with what Brian has said on the heels, if you will, kind of my, my book, this really came out last week. We just didn't all get to hear it. The bookends of our lesson last week, looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you would turn down to verse 24, verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. You know, there's a couple of, of uh, definitions for the word strive. One, and both of them involve effort or involve work. One of them is to, to, to work together, work hard. You see, I had a note about that. Yeah, to work hard, to strive. And the second one is to struggle in opposition to something. If you strive against something, you're, you're laboring in opposition to it. Whereas if you strive with someone, you're laboring in concert with it. Brother Sam, I don't... What, what you were talking, that uh, what Brother Pat must have been talking about, is the reconciliation of ministry that we are supposed to do. Very kind. Yes, of course. Very kind. Yeah. Reconciliation. The ministry Somebody of reconciliation. Yeah. Yep. And we do have that ministry, well, yeah, that, you're right. I'll just say that. I'm not prepared to go down that trail just yet, but you're right. It, it, we're talking about the ministry, if you will. It is a resource, a ministry resource for reconciliation, which is what Brother Pat is endeavoring to do with his brother and the Lord. Yes, ma'am. I would say also that sometimes we don't realize, using the example that Pat had with his brother, it's uh, several different people from our church have met his brother mm. and have had time with him. And sometimes we forget that this ministry of kindness and uh, sufficiency of grace, exceed, it goes outside of the walls of this church. Oh, absolutely. When you're not in, when you're in church, you're, it's ever present in your mind. Yes, indeed. But sometimes people, when they go outside of the church, right. they forget to bear all those kindnesses and <laughs> things like that. And so uh, Joe has had the witness of numerous men in our church that he has had opportunity to meet through my husband. And he notices that. Oh, amen. You know, he, you know, because he has said, you know, sometimes... Well, that guy was a bit of a jerk. Or he'll say, I really like him. He's very nice, you know. Uh -huh. uh, you get, we get feedback. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and so the grace that God gives us has to work all the time. Uh, amen. As a ministry. We can't just leave it on the pew when we leave the church, right? Right. Yeah, amen. And I would say that, uh, nowhere near the same as it is for, for Brother Pat, but Joe has become a burden on my heart. I mean, you know, and largely because I know and love Pat, so if it matters to Pat, it matters to me. But if it matters to the Lord, it ought to matter to me too, and I know that Joe does matter to the Lord. And so Joe has become a burden on my heart that whenever, as often as I think of him, and I, I enjoy his company, you know, he's just... He's very nice. Yeah, he's... Easy to be. He's what I think of a Bolton, you know, outgoing and gregarious and, and interactive and that sort of thing, and, and a fun guy, you know. But I heard a sermon years ago by a fellow, Bill Stafford was his name. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Bill Stafford. He was a Southern Baptist evangelist from years ago, and he preached a sermon called Good People. And he's talking about how good people are going to go to hell. Being good people doesn't keep you out of hell, you know. You've got to be godly. You've got to have Christ 
Nobody understands that better than Pat Bolton. Nobody has a better burden, greater burden for his brother than Pat. But we share that burden. We share that responsibility. We also, as Bonnie says, because Pat brings Joe into contact with us. He's participated in the golf outings and stuff like that. He brings him into contact with us so that we might pick up our share of the burden and try to minister to, if you will, love on him, to, well, to grace on him, if you will, this aspect of God's love and what God's grace is supposed to be for salvation. So, as I was looking here at this, we're talking about the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle on all men, must not strive. Uh, that means must not work in opposition. We are to strive in the sense of working hard in cooperation, in concert with each other to get the will of God done, but we're not to strive and work in opposition, which is an interesting thing to take, if you will, the same word, and depending on the context, it has a totally opposite meaning. <laughs> to strive can mean to work together, or to strive can mean to work against each other. So, but we're not supposed to, we're not to work against each other. And it's talking about against other human beings here, you see, but rather than striving against being opposition, but be gentle unto all men, unto all men, all men. Bonnie, it gets kind of hard sometimes when I get behind a wheel of a car <laughs> to be gentle unto all men. I mean, you know, there's a, uh, you guys don't look like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> you th well, you're, I know what you're, you're thinking, Brother Hugh, you get that way behind a wheel? Yeah, sometimes. You know, I have a conscience that sits over, you know, on the other side of the car from me, and she's very vocal sometimes about, hey, what, no, don't, yeah, 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 yeah. and so it's like, okay, I'll calm down, you know. But must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. That, all men, if you, you know, I can search in Takarta, the same Bible app that Brother Mark likes to use. I have a different format on mine, font and all that kind of stuff. It's the same program. And you can search for not just words, but you can search for phrases, you know. There's a, do a, a Boolean search for phrases. If you search on all men, especially in the New Testament, you see some interesting patterns develop in, when God talks about all men. And... Um, and it really sit, flies in the face of what our Calvinist brethren want to, want to, you know, impose upon us sometimes. But, and we'll see some of that uh, ourselves here as we go along. I think. But all men must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Um, I'm mindful in twelve John twelve thirty two. I think it is where Christ says, "I be lifted up; I will draw all men to me." That, tell, that gives my Gentile heart uh, a lot of calm assurance that even when our Savior was here, to, as pastor's been talking about, um, here to, to the Jew, and, you know, to the lost tribe of the house of Israel, and he was here to fulfill the law, and he was here in a very real way to fulfill all those promises and prophecies that it was time to do. Um, there's still some yet to come, as we've been studying about that too. When we get raptured out of here, the, the prophecy program resumes, and, and they go back to that. But by Christ saying, if I be lifted up, I will draw, draw all men to me, that's one of many aspects of his earthly ministry and even his ministry in Paul that assure me that he hadn't forgotten about us Gentiles. And of course, we know that today, that there's neither Jew nor Gentile. In the body of Christ, we're all, we're just body parts, you know, <laughs> of the same body. But that Christ was lifted up to me back in the early 1960s. And I was drawn to him to the point of being irresistibly drawn to him. I felt like I could no longer resist that drawing. And I was drawn to him. He uses... Well, of course, his spirit, of course, but he uses the word, and he uses people who articulate that word that have an impact on us. And, they, you know, we, had a, we have a term called being put under conviction. I was under tremendous conviction. I was convicted of my sins. I was convicted of my need of a Savior. 
And God drew me through that, through the preaching of the cross, and what I deemed to be finally an irresistible drawing that said, okay, that I can't fight against this anymore. I've got to have some relief here, you know. I've got to give up. And boom, it was like the weight of the world. I didn't even know I had it on me, but it was like the weight of the world was off my shoulders in an instant. It was like the weight of the world was, if you will, raptured off my soul. And I have never... And even since then, I've had a few resurgences or revivals along the way and that sort of thing in my heart. You know, you get encumbered by the sin that so easily doth beset us, that sort of thing in life. And you maybe sometimes forget, and especially if you've been at it for maybe decades, you kind of tend to not remember that experience, that the vitality of that moment of being saved by grace through faith and getting that weight lifted off of you. But if you can think back with me right now, you at home do the same thing. Think back to me, with me, to the point of your salvation, to the point where grace became ever so real to you, that you were saved by grace through faith, the faith of Jesus Christ that he gave to you. Think about where you are and, and where you were there. And it's almost like saying, every once in a while I have to remind myself of how driven I was when I was dating my soon-to-be wife. You know, I was passionate. I mean, I was obsessed with focusing my energies and my activities towards spending time with that girl and being with her. And it hasn't, really hasn't waned on almost 50 years, but every once in a while I have to say, wait a minute, I don't want to take her for granted because I know, you know, two years ago yesterday, we lost our dear friend Michelle Falk in a very, in my estimation, still an untimely loss for us and for Brother Tim and for the family. And I know, you know, my mother passed away on my third birthday. I know that it could be just like that, that we don't have someone most precious to us, you know. I think about that for our pastor. I think about that for some of you. I think about that especially for my wife and even my, my children. My kids are all Katie's not yet, but my two eldest are in their 40s, and that's when you start to fall apart, right? So, you know, some of us have trouble remembering our 40s, you know. <laughs> we've, we've got a lot, so many other aches and pains that have come along since then, it's kind of like, really? Man, I, I guess I did do all that stuff back then. But anyway, I don't even know where I'm going with this now. But I will say that it, Brother Bill wants to say something, so Brother Jerry, if you could get back there. You did have your hand up, right, Brother Bill? Okay, good. Get, hey, get me off this rabbit track and trail and get me back on track, would you, brother? It's on. Hi, Fred and Nancy and everybody else out there watching. Uh, one of the verses that I always go to on grace is Romans 5.20, and it goes back to what Hugh was talking about, that moment that you weren't with Jesus, but you became that way. Moreover, the law entered that offense might abound where... But where sin abound, bounded, grace did much more abound. Um, used to work in the uh, addiction ministry for a long time, so we leaned on that one big time because you're coming from a, you know, a place where you, you really can't judge anybody about all that. You just know sin's existence, but grace does much more abound is what we always focus on there in that particular ministry. And so it's Romans 5. What was it? 20? 520, yes, yeah, what you said. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess that's the one that I lean on on grace the most because when I think about Pat and what he does, he doesn't, he doesn't look back and say, okay, does this person, uh, you know, is this person ready to hear this? He just says, okay, they're all sinners. Everybody's a sinner and everybody needs grace. And so I'm going to make my presentation. I wish I had that forwardness he has. But. Yeah, amen. Amen. We could, if we could clone that, we could. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Can you imagine a whole church of Pat Bolton's unleashed? Whew. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Uh, I, would, I was going to label that with abundance because, you know, Christ can have life have more abundantly. Well, that's the source of our abundance, is it not? Is that, is that grace that he provides that abundance? Christelle's over here, Brother Jerry. I'll be right there with you, sis. Hang on just a moment. 
There we go. Um, for me, I was kind of, it was kind of weird because as I'd been thinking about it, you used some of the words that I would do. Um, load lifting or weight bearing was one. Um, and then it's also life changing and future changing um, from Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And for me, that's um, a constant reminder. Romans 6, 14? Yes, sir. Okay. And now, let me see. That's, you said load-bearing or weight-lifting? Yep. And uh, then life-changing and future-altering. All right. I'm going to say, let's say load, I'm going to use load-bearing. Load I should have got. I should have brought the big board out. And life changing. And future altering. Yep. Those life. Kind of go hand in hand to me. And future. I'll be able to read this even if you guys can't. Changing. Oh, that that is so true. So very true. Um, and indeed it is. Um, load. <laughs> well, again, you go back to the, that, and I think you mentioned it, the sufficiency, that it, this is kind of what it's sufficient for, and that it does carry the weight, lift the weight. And there are times in every person's life where there is a, a loss or an ailment or an affliction or a struggle of some sort, sometimes of our own making. You know, after all, we're, we're, you know, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, we've also sinned and come short of the glory of grace and the, and the, and the work of grace in our lives, and we tend to lapse back into that at a moment's, uh, not less than notice, but <laughs> shock, surprise. And yet we need that grace to help us bear the load, like so oftentimes of our own mistakes, but oftentimes some things that we had no we had no involvement in. Um, I had no involvement in losing Michelle Falk two years ago yesterday, uh, but I sure did feel the weight of it, and it was only by God's grace that we could carry on and continue on without her. So, uh, with and in that, and in that, it changed. Uh, our lives, Brother Tim's lives, their kids' lives, and it changed their future. And the grace, the grace that we're seeing in Brother Tim's life enabled him to find, although she was already there, but to find in a new way, a new relationship with Lisa, with Lisa Little, now Lisa Falk, that changed that grace that bore, helped Brother Tim bear the load of the loss of his dear uh, spouse of 40 years, enabled him to change his life and his future um, with Lisa. And it, it is, that, that is such a cool relationship. They're, they're going to be coming in tonight, so we'll be seeing them here. They'll be here for the golf outing next week. Oh, by the way, fellas, I need your money. Please pay me. Brother Pat will fire me if you don't. Um, but their relationship, you know, Lisa lost her husband, Paul, dear friend of ours as well. Tim lost Michelle. And all about, you know, you've heard Brother Tim's testimony, how God just kind of worked them back together themselves. And that's, that is the grace of God. And I, I just, I marvel at it. I marvel at it. I still every once in a while will slip up and say Tim and Michelle, because sometimes I'm talking about Tim and Michelle. But sometimes I'll slip up and say it when I mean Tim and Lisa. I'm getting better at it. But Tim, I also have difficulty with switch, saying Lisa and Tim as opposed to Lisa and Paul. <laughs> so, but the grace that they have allows us to do that. So anyway, uh, Brother Brian is behind you there, Brother Jerry. Yeah, I'm looking right now in this country. We're celebrating our freedom from another country. And if you go in uh, Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5 there, it says, But God was rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved so uh, we have been freed from the curse of death and sin there and that's the greatest freedom that we could ever have is that freedom there 
You know, even though we may lose our freedom as a country, we'll never lose the freedom that you're describing. Amen. That cannot be taken from us. We can't surrender it. We can't forfeit it. <laughs> that's the, to me, that's the, that's the real blessing of this age. This, you know, we talk about the, the age of grace or the church age, or I, I like to call it even the, the Holy Spirit age, because in this age we're in, this dispensation of God's grace that we're in, we, of all dispensations, have the assurance of the seal of the Holy Spirit on us, sealing us into the body of Christ, that we cannot break that seal. No man can break that seal, not even himself or herself. No, say, we're, we're immune, if you will, not immune to his attacks, but we're immune to his destruction, to, the, to Satan's destruction on our life, our soul, our spirit. So hallelujah, we have that liberty, and, we have, and we're secure in that liberty. I see that our time is really done for today. Thank you very much for your participation. We'll, we'll hit it again next week. In fact, I'm not even finished with my comments here from 2 Timothy. But I'd like to think that this is beneficial for us, and that we, as we contribute as members in particular of our class, as we, can, com, as we contribute our thoughts, our perspectives, our outlooks, there's no more, no greater topic than we can do this with than that of grace. But by the grace of God, here we are. Praise the Lord. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had. Thank you for our folks at home that have tuned in with us. We pray, Father, that while we're doing this here, we would pray that it would be a, a blessing to them as well and, and uh, maybe even figure out some way for them to interact. Um, think about that. If you would like to interact with us, we could maybe do it on my phone or something, but let us know. Anyway, Lord, help us to sort that out. <laughs> God, thank you for the United States of America. Thank you for the sacrifices that were paid by our founding fathers and, and mothers we pray that you'll bless <clears throat> us this day to walk worthy of that founding. And tomorrow, as we mark it on our calendars, that this uh, great land, one nation under God, would be indeed a great land. Bless, Father. Bless our services to come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. <laughs>